is seven last plagues in Armageddon, and with that in mind, there's been a number of times in the past where God has revealed that he says enough is enough. He cannot let mankind go on their path of destruction because God loves his people. One example of that, when God said the limits had been reached of man's sins or iniquities, was the flood. The Bible says their thoughts were evil continually. Another time, the Bible gives us the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the angels came and almost had to drag Sodom, uh, I mean Lot and his wife and the, the two children out of the city. They were so attached to the familiarity of life. Egypt. God called his people out of Egypt. It was tough for them to leave. The nation of Israel that God had called to be the example to the world of what it's like to live a godly life. But they got so used to the flesh pots of Egypt that they didn't want to leave. They even mentioned a couple times later on in the Old Testament that they wanted to go back to Egypt when things got tough in the wilderness. But tonight's topic is talking about the seven last plagues. And not too many people want to discuss them because they're not an easy topic to look at. But again, friends, when we know Jesus, we've read his book, spent time with him. These messages are, again, another message of the love of God. Why? He's warning his created that someday when the last person can be saved, will be saved, God will be the judge that he always has been. And he will set wrongs right. When the world is falling apart around us, when there's many things today that we witness that we cannot change, God says, hold fast till I come. He is going to take care of these unexpecteds. Armageddon, it's not the first plague. It comes in the order God wants us to understand it. That when these natural disasters take place, they're like the early birth pains of a mother having a child. We'll see, my friends, that our money that we carry in our pocket is mere paper very soon. We cannot rely on our paper to take care of the world's problems tonight. How many would agree with that? Come on. Because as fast as we think we're fixing one problem, another one pops up. How could a loving God afflict God's people that he created with sores from head to toe. How could he allow the rivers of, blood, rivers of water to turn to blood? These rivers of life. Because God knows when the last person will be saved. When does this period take place? Some call it the time of tribulation. Are God's people raptured out before? If so, why does he give us the information of the plagues? Are we on the verge of the tribulation and the time of the end and the battle of Armageddon? We'll see these signs as we go on. But Revelation is the book of his character, and it must reveal how he will preserve his people. Now, a number of times we've read this chapter. We call it the chapter of the three angels' messages. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach. May I summarize? To everybody saying with a loud voice, with me please, fear God and give glory to him. Monday night we'll talk about how we do that. For the hour of his judgment, when our lives set wrong right about our creator, has come. Fear God, not in the sense of being afraid of God, but rather respecting and honoring and obeying, because the devil says there will be no one in the last days who does that thing. But it is our character because God has made us that way and he loves us so that we read in his scripture and we end up worshiping God. Not any God, but the creator God. Amen? We know what the Bible says. We do have a creator that has the power to speak worlds into existence. And because of that creator, our loving creator, the Sabbath, that holy time with our creator is important. Third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, if anybody worships a counterfeit or the beast, and his image receives a mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall go on to drink the wine of the wrath of God. So either we show value to our creator because we love him, or the absence of love for our creator is actually worshiping man's 
counterfeit, showing value to the counterfeit, because something takes our heart away from our creator. And that which takes our heart away from our creator is what we worship. Are you hearing me tonight? God goes on to say he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. The devil has convinced people that God is so loving that he won't destroy anybody. Everybody's going to be in heaven. The devil's going to see fit to prove them wrong. The three angels' message warns us tonight so that we will be ready. There's no reason anyone should miss heaven. It's a simple choice. Revelation predicts this final great conflict between good and evil, between true and false, between authentic and counterfeit. Here is the patience of the saints. We discovered this this morning and last night. They have patience because God gave us patience. They have patience because patience comes through much tribulation. They have patience because they went through the hours that we're going to read about tonight. And during that time of difficulty, they cherish God's commandments. And their faith has been strengthened by times of difficulty. The great controversy or the great conflict in the last day of verse history is a struggle in the what? Ah, remember this. Especially when we get to the last part of the message and we talk about the battle of Armageddon. Struggle of the mind. The great battle is a battle for the soul. That gift of life that only God can give. It revolves around who do we value? Who do we worship? Who do we really believe God is in our life? Being honest about it now is the good thing to do. Because when we're honest about what God is worth, what takes the place of God is the danger of what God wants to remove from our lives so that he can fill our lives with the blessing. That's why we've been studying these stories in Daniel and Revelation. Jesus said to read the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to strengthen his kingdom by setting up a counterfeit. Friends, counterfeits will never take the place of the authentic. Amen? As much as we think we can build our own way to the kingdom of God, we cannot. You can be the best human being on planet earth by everything you know to do still you can't work your way out of this planet Daniel chapter 2 was God's blessing the knowledge of the future man created a counterfeit of all gold it was still a counterfeit even though if you could have that gold image you'd probably take it over the one in Daniel 2 because it was worth more to the eye of humanity but to God the truth is always worth more the last days an attempt will be made again to substitute a counterfeit for that which God has given us. Notice in chapter 15, John writes, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Here it comes. Say it with me. Seven angels having what? For in them the wrath of God is complete. Again, if God is as loving as he is, he must punish those who who want nothing to do with him. He cannot protect those who want nothing to do with God. God's wrath. It's not his anger at that which he has created. It's not. It is his judgment, setting wrongs right. During the seven last plague, God withdraws his protective hand and all the evil forces will cut loose on this planet. The seven last plagues are an awesome result of the world separating themselves from God and his word in the correction that it can give us, loving correction. If we continue and insist as humanity to separate ourselves from God, it's no wonder we go through difficulties. At the end of the age, the worldwide preaching of the gospel will take place. 
But there's a time coming when it will not be able to be told, as you'll see. All humanity makes a final choice. The mark of the beast will be inflicted as a final conflict between good and evil. God's people will be loyal to him, not because they have to or because they're doing something they have to do to get to heaven, but it's a result of God's love within us. Seven last plagues will be poured out, and then Christ will deliver his people. Now tonight, I'm thankful for the Old Testament. For the what? Old Testament. Because all of these things were given as examples for us. And you'll notice the Old Testament plagues are how many? The Old Testament plagues are how many? Ten. And the New Testament plagues are how many? Seven. Why the difference? What is the difference? Three. Why the difference? Interesting point. It is a message of hope. God tells us in the first three plagues that they not only fell on the Egyptians, but they also fell on the children of Israel. Why? They were getting comfortable in Egypt. Hear the message. God had to make the children of Israel know that Egypt, even though you have all your needs met here in Egypt, you cannot get comfortable here. This is not the place I have ordained you to work. So the first three plagues, water turning to blood, frogs, gnats, or lice, it fell on both Egyptians as well as the children of Israel that were in Egypt. But then the following seven only fell on the Egyptians. So now tonight we're going to see seven plagues in the New Testament. And God says no plague will come near your dwelling. The place we want to keep in mind, my friends, as the coming events happen. Once we know God, once we read his word on a regular basis, our faith grows stronger. We have our eyes on the kingdom of God, not on this world. Revelation 15:8. This is a, an important text because it says, no one will enter the temple. Now, you have a mansion there. How many have a mansion in the temple of God? Come on, let me see your hands. How many have faith? All right, you have a mansion there. God says you will not enter your mansion until the seven plagues of the seven angels are completed. So anybody that's teaching you're going to go to heaven before... The plagues fall. They need to be reading Revelation. It makes it clear. You will not go into the temple of God until the plagues are finished. God's in his temple now doing a great judgment as we've discovered. But there's a coming time, as Revelation says, when his judgment will be finished. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. God could not change him through the thousands of years. Humanity will choose. He who is holy, let him be holy still. We have this day, this moment, to understand God's word, to gain the faith that he wants to give us so that we will be one of two people. The righteous or the unrighteous. The final crisis will not be what nation you came from or based upon your good works. The final crisis is that coming upon the world will lead men and women to make one of two choices, either be completely invested in our creator or not. The tendency of a human heart is to pull away from God because there's so many things we want to do. But when we realize everything we do on this planet is so temporary, you start investing in the kingdom of God. Chapter 16, as we continue Revelation 16, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way, pour out the bowls of wrath on the earth. Notice, the angels cannot, will not, Pour the plagues upon planet earth until Jesus says it's time. When it talks about his people in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, he says the angels are holding back the four corners of the earth from all the winds of strife blowing on planet earth until Jesus tells them it's finished. Do God's people go through tri tribulation? Of course. Why would he tell us about these plagues if they weren't going to affect the people? 
the Israelis were protected by God during those plagues on the last seven as they were poured out on the Egyptians. Paul says now all of these things, only Bible Paul had was the Old Testament. He says all of these things happened to them as what? Examples, and they are written for who? Our admonition, encouragement, uplifting, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So God gives us these stories to encourage us to give us examples of how he will protect those who choose him. Just as the Israelis were present through the plagues and delivered at the what? End of the plagues, so God's people are present, but they're protected through the plagues and delivered at the end of the plagues. Exodus chapter five, verse one, after Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus said the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. The last plague, as we already discussed on the night of Saul becoming Paul, the last plague was blood on the doorpost. They went through Egypt and all the plagues. They saw what happened when the Egyptians refused God's salvation. But interesting enough, we know certain Egyptians went out of Egypt with the children of Israel. A large portion of them so never give up hope on those who don't claim to be followers of our Christ. The Hebrew worthies went through the fiery furnace. If God allowed them to go through and Jesus tells us to read and understand Daniel, then we must have a challenge in the future that God will carry us through. Faith is not something that helps you to avoid something, but it's something it is God's gift to help us to go through, to endure, and to hold fast to the source of our faith. Revelation declares God's people are triumphant. They go through the tribulation. They're victorious when we read Revelation chapter seven and 14. Notice Revelation seven says, after these things I looked and beheld a great multitude which no man could number, not just 144,000. Of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne of God and before the lamb. Lamb clothed in what? White robes and palm branches in their hands. So these are the ones that what? Come out of great tribulation. They have washed the robes. And the robes in the Bible means characters. And made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Do you see the process? The last generation, the last group of people before Jesus comes visibly will go through this time and they're remarkably preserved, protected by their creator God. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people will hear this message before Jesus comes. And he who sits on the throne, what my friends? will finally dwell with his people. That's what I look forward to. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. Why? For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne of all thrones will shepherd them, lead them to living fountains of waters. Pure water, crystal clear water, the source of life, water. And God finally will wipe away every tear from their eyes. All right, so the plagues tonight, again, they're messages of hope. And only if we know Christ can we see hope in this message. First plague is poured out. How many have ever had boils in your life? Let me see your hands. Oh, we lived on the dairy farm. And staph infection would run through the cattle just in a matter of hours, the whole herd would have staph infection. And from time to time, our neighbors would come and visit us. One time, my sister and her small children would come and visit us there on the farm, and one of her smaller girls got staph infection, and it went into her bloodstream, and before long, she would have these boils. In the matter of an hour or two, this huge boil the size of a chicken egg coming up, swelling up the facial tissue or the arm or wherever it came, and the infection would just blow up to where the girl was screaming. She was very young, three, four years old, 
and they'd have to rush her off to the doctor. When he would lance it, it would just squirt across the room. It was a terrible thing to witness. Sores. Now remember this. God will not allow his people to go through these plagues. Because everyone that will be saved by that time will have been saved. Will have accepted Jesus. But the contrast tonight is what God says in his word versus what man says at this time. We looked a little bit at what man says he will do in this hour. Because man says, if you do X, Y, Z, man will save you. Watch, in this time, God says, no, you can't save anybody. A loth him and grieve him, sore, a, a blister, whatever it is, it will only fall on those who chose to receive the mark when they knew the difference. Whether it be boils, whatever it is, it's a sore that comes upon people and causes great pain. At the same time, this morning we looked at what this country says it will do in regard to that image of the Antichrist beast. This country, as we read this morning, had the power to give life unto the beast, unto the beast, no, an image of the beast. So we studied the Antichrist power through the Dark Ages, a 1260-year period where church and state came together and forced people to worship according to their principles of doctrine, which was primarily pagan at that time. So when this country, as we discovered this morning, that second beast in Revelation 13, has power to give life unto an image of that same beast, it is going to set up a form of legislation where it forces a day of worship, as we already discovered. That that likeness of the beast power would both speak, legislate, and cause force by legislation. That's what it means in the Greek. That as many as would not worship the image of beast would be what? So do you get it? The first plague comes, which is sores. Why? Because this country will force the entire world to worship a counterfeit. I read from Supreme Court Justice this morning that their plan is to force our whole country to go back to Sunday worship. That is already in the works. They say, unless you worship, on the day we tell you, there will be a death penalty People tell me all the time, Lynn, it'll never happen in our country. Land of the free, home of the brave. No, we have freedom here. When Bill Clinton was in office, they put 70 new crimes in the list that you can actually get the death penalty for. And what did most citizens say? Yeah, we need to be tougher on crime. They say, and take, unless you take the mark of the beast, you're going to be punished. You will be physically punished. What does God say? He lets the sores fall on those that push the mark of the beast. They can't physically protect you then. And yet they say they will if you do what they tell you to do. You see, friends, in the first plague, God is teaching us that he wants us to stand for the right. Now, this is a time where we build spiritual muscles. When people say, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, it's because they don't have faith. Paul says, I beseech you. What's another word for beseech you? Beg. I beg you, Paul says, brethren, by the mercies of God. Isn't God merciful? For him to give us life this long as a human race. By the mercies of God that you present your... Oh, interesting. Don't miss Monday night. We're going to have a lot of fun then. That you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice holy and what acceptable not unto you you know it's it's hard sometimes to please yourself as the way you want your body to feel and look acceptable unto god watch carefully which is your miserable service <coughs> doesn't it feel like it sometimes you try to be healthy and all you try to do everything you try to do something comes around you didn't expect god says your body is an opportunity to make it a sacrifice to God. 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. There's a reason for it. The first plague comes as we read through it today in a time of peace primarily so that we can understand when we are in love with God, he promises he will take care of you. Your physical security is not in the Obama plan or the medical society around you today or the hospitals, the doctors or nurses. Absolutely not. That is not where physical strength comes from. The safety in our physical well-being always comes from our creator. And we'll learn more about that Monday night. It's powerful. He says, if you do what I tell you to do because you love me, I will take care of you. Now, I have to be honest with you tonight. Monday night, I'm going to reveal some things that I have gone through in the past. I thought as long as I did X, Y, Z, I was going to be in perfect health. All of a sudden, I realized there's always the surprise of life. Talk more about that Monday night. If God is your refuge and strength, he is also your very present what? Help when you're in trouble. That's what God's people understand. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. That's a lot of action there. When we get in that difficulty of that time, all of these verses you have learned and read and studied and meditated will give you hope when everything's falling apart. So, when those who push the mark of the beast knowing what we know about the mark, push the counterfeit instead of subscribing to the authentic seal of the living God. When they push it, when they force society to follow into unity made by man, a sore will take place on those who are pushing it. The next one in Revelation 16 tells us, verse 3, that the seas turn to blood. The water of life begins to turn into the blood of a dead man. Second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. There's nothing worse than the source of life turning into the blood of a dead man. I hope you're getting this spiritual picture here. God right now is giving you the water of life absolutely free. Can I hear a response? He's giving us the word. It's setting on the shelf. We have more Bibles today than we ever heard of. During the dark ages, it was illegal to have this holy book. You'd be killed in your front yard. Today we have many copies, more versions. There's no reason in the world that anybody could. You can get an app on your phone where it can read the Bible to you while you're doing whatever you're doing. You can get the Greek and Hebrew on your phone. You can get every tool you can imagine absolutely free. When I first went into ministry, I had to pay hundreds of dollars just to get the King James on my computer. And now it's all free. When the water of life is cut off, and it will be soon. We'll see that in a moment. Prophecy predicts there'll be a famine in the land. Not for food and water, but for the word of God. When the blood, when the water turns to blood of a dead man, not just blood, any blood, but the blood of a dead man carrying disease, all kind of bacteria, it is not carrying the source of life. The word that you will hear will not be God's word. It will be man's word, which is dead. Cannot give you life. Every living creature in the sea dies. Now there's something literal about this plague. Imagine, friends, they've been watching the Gulf of Mexico for a good while. Every summer, all the water comes out of Houston. It used to be about five years ago, just went out about 25 miles, where the concentration of that water coming out of Houston for 25 miles out in the Gulf was so dense that fish couldn't live in it. You had to travel at least 25 miles away from Houston to get into waters where you could get live fish and, 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 and you know, get a good fish that you could eat. But now it's gone from 25 to 50 and sometimes it's out 75 miles. It's been all over public broadcasting how this water is becoming not a good source of life. Pollution, they say. 
So imagine what would happen if just the Gulf of Mexico turned to blood. I mean, it wouldn't be 30 minutes later, the entire world would know what happened. And what would then take place? Very likely, they would st shut the stock market down instantly. Why? Because we know, even the atheists know what the Bible says. And when something like this happens, it's all over the internet. China, when, that, when their waters turned to red blood, it was all over the internet. They were asking, people were asking, is this the plug, plagues of the Bible? They weren't even Christians asking. Fear will run rampant, and when fear hits, the stock market falls to nothing. Grocery stores, the shelves will be cleaned off bare instantaneously as soon as we see these characteristics on a wide scale basis. At the same time, it has a spiritual lesson for us tonight. This country, again, reading Revelation 13, the second beast, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads, okay? That no man might be able to buy or sell, say he that, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the first ones, they say you take the mark of the beast or you're going to have your life affected. What happens? They're the ones that get the, the sores. Physical security only comes from Christ. They go on to say, unless you take the mark, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. What happens? Water turns to blood. Stock market falls. Groceries are gone. The problem is, friends, if our character are not being strengthened now, our, our thoughts and feelings concerning God and our fellow man, if it's not in Christ Jesus now, we won't be able to find Christianity at that moment. Economic security only comes from one place. Our dollar is what it's worth now because of Christ and him crucifying and his angels holding back the winds of strife. Third plague. Rivers and fountains. So watch, it goes from a small body of water, whether it be the ocean or a sea, whatever the second plague is, to the source of water. This is trouble. It's one thing to have a body of water out there where the news says turn to blood. But when your source of water, look what happened to Flint, Michigan. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, you do? It's all over the news. They found out they've been drinking this water that's been bad for them for a number of months, maybe even years. And now they're going to watch their children, and now the lawsuits are just mounding up against Michigan. That's just from lead in the water. What happens when all of water turns to blood? The city officials, the, gov the state officials, federal government, nobody's going to be able to fix the problem. And remember, these are the same legislators that were forced by the religious movement that pushes them to bring in Sunday laws, as we read about from Supreme Court Justice this morning. These are the ones that were forced to force the Sunday laws in our land because the religious movement were forcing them to do it. And now the people are going to go to them and say, look, our water's cut off. Where are we going to get good water? Third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Now watch the angels. We talked about the angels looking over the books of heaven right now. Amen. Making sure that everyone that's getting ready to go home as Jesus comes for us are safe to save. Watch what they say when they witness this. Clearly the water is a symbol of life. And I heard an angel of the waters say, together please, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and is to be. You are what? You're doing the right thing, Lord, when you turn the water to blood because you have judged these things. They saw in advance what these people chose to do against God's people who believe in the principles God has given us. So they tell Jesus when this happens. Why? Because I'm sure Jesus is going to grieve when he sees his created being punished. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God will love even the wicked when he has to punish them. The angels go on to say, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. 
for this is their just due. Again, the Bible says in Psalms 37, verse 4 and 5, he will give you the desires of your heart. So when the wicked want blood of those Christians who are hanging on to the principles of the Ten Commandments and not taking unity upon the Sunday, when they hang on to that instead of being in unity with all religions, they want the blood of these people that are not bringing unity, If they want blood, God's going to give them blood. The water will turn to blood. He gives us the desire of our heart. Isaiah 33, talking about this time, it says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised who? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who? He who walketh what? righteously, and we can only do that if we're in Christ, and speaketh uprightly. What we say is what God gives us to say. He that despiseth the gain of the oppressions, he that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the caves or the munitions of rocks. Say it with me. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. It says nothing about ice cream. Bread and water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king. Now notice. They shall behold the land that is where? Very far off. Listen, friends, hold on to this moment. Isaiah says there's coming a time when you're going to be so tested that you're almost feeling like, I can't go on any further. Look what's happening. The mark of the beast has happened already. They're forcing us to do what we don't agree, but you won't give in. And the sores are falling around. You know this is what God said would happen. The oceans turning to blood, the rivers and fountains turning to blood. Yes, you may get bread with the ravens. You may have just enough water to drink to survive. And you feel like I can't go through much more. This is a test beyond my imagination. God says he will give you a personal vision of the king and heaven itself. And when you get that vision, it'll be all it takes to go through into the end. It will be like somebody giving you that high test you need. Yes! You won't focus on what's happening on planet Earth because you saw the kingdom of God. The land where your home is. Where God has prepared a place for you. You will go through with the character of Christ. That's what he promises. All of our life, my friends. All of our life comes from Christ. This is what the plagues are for, to give us security in Christ and Christ alone. The fourth plague is an interesting, it's one, it's one that the sun, well, gets pretty hot. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with great heat. And instead of confessing, instead of repenting, what did they do? Oh, whatever God did this to us, that's terrible. Why would he do such a thing? Where is God? Atheists making fun of the Christians and their Sunday. Now all of a sudden, this day of the sun becomes something they don't even want to talk about. So notice, they blaspheme the name of God, the character of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. They did not repent. They did not turn back and say, Lord, forgive us. When persecution comes, either we are in Christ or we are not. It's not something you can flip a light switch and be a good person when you need to be. Good person characteristics doesn't doesn't come from us. It comes from God. It's something that he gives us day by day, friends. God's trying to tell us clearly. The plagues reveal where our trust is invested in today. God wants us to be ready for this time. He wants us to know that he is here for us. These aren't things you buy. 
These aren't things you must acquire. These are gifts of our creator. God wants us to be ready. Clearly, in Egypt's day, they worshiped the sun god, Ra. In Rome, they worshiped the sun god, Mithra. All through the ages. In Babylon, they worshiped the sun god, Belmarduk. All through the ages, they've worshiped the sun. God says, if you insist and you go on to make a law that everybody must worship on Sunday instead of honoring God's holy day from the beginning of time, if that's what you insist, I'll turn up the sun. I'll give you the desires of your heart. He said, I gave you my Sabbaths to be a sign between your creator and his people, that they may know that I am the Lord who what? Keeping the Sabbath doesn't sanctify us. It's God who sanctifies us, amen? And he gave us a Sabbath to remind us that we have a creator God. The Sabbath doesn't go back to the Jews. It goes back to Adam and Eve. 108 languages tell us which day is the Sabbath. All true worship. All true value is Jesus Christ. Everything he gives us lasts forever. It never diminishes in worth to his people. He who dwells in the secret place of who? The Most High. Read it with me. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, says David, he is my refuge and my fortress who my God in him I will trust surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence you shall not be afraid nor the terror of by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness it's not talking about the Texas roaches nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Say it together. A thousand may fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come near you. That's God's promises tonight. David, David says in Psalms 91, only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge even the most high thy habitation there shall no evil befall thee come on together neither shall any plague come nigh near thy dwelling people say Lynn I know I'm going to be raptured out before the plagues no he gives us all this information so we know when we go through it it's because you love the Lord Jesus Christ you follow in his footsteps when he say, this is the way, walk ye in it. You do what he calls you to do. You don't put it off because it's not like we, we say, uh, don't call me now, Lord. I'll call you later. No, you take the gift of God drawing us to his will. Now, for he shall give his angels. How many want to see your angel? Come on, I do. He's been saving my neck and the rest of me a long time. I want to see him. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep you in all your ways. Hallelujah. Boy, won't we have something to talk about? Lynn, you should have been with me. Do you know what happened? The tree of life's going to be an interesting place. And everything you hear will be absolutely true. Characteristic number five. Plague number five. This is interesting. Darkness falls upon the seat of the Antichrist. Fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. That's the Antichrist beast. And his kingdom became full of darkness. What is going on here? The entire time we've been reading about the 13, not the 13, the 10 characteristics of the Antichrist through the Dark Ages, they received the deadly wound in 1798 when the French government said, I've had enough of it. Now the deadly wound was healed, early 1900s, and now we're in the time of healing where all the world is modeling after that power and following and trying to find a way where we all can be united in one faith. 
and we look to that power to unite the world. There's only one source of light and truth. It's Jesus Christ. When this darkness falls upon this seat of the beast, it will be a fulfillment, the final fulfillment of the Catholic prophet that has been 100% correct to this time. When this pope was elected, 2020 did a special program on the fact that the Catholic prophet back in 11, the 1100 time period predicted every future pope from his time forward. 2020 did an examination of all the popes from the 1100 time period up to now. And the, the prophet, the Catholic prophet's name is Malachi, he, he actually predicted every pope and named their name of what they would be like in rulership, and he predicted this pope would be the last pope. He would come on the scene very much like a lamb, bringing all the world to him, and then he would turn into a dictator, and the world would see as God, because of the dictatorship of this pope, forcing the church to go back to what they're supposed to be doing, God would bring fire down from heaven and destroy Rome. Now this is what the Catholic prophet has said. When we see darkness on the place we've been looking for spiritual leadership, and they gnaw their tongues because of the pain, it will be a fulfillment of the fifth plague. The world has one place to look, now and forevermore. God's word, his righteousness, his guide for his people across all religious barriers. Jesus has created us all in the blood of Adam. If we understand that, we won't look to presidents, we won't look to state senators, we won't look to anybody else for leadership, we'll look to God. We will be an individual entity of the mouthpiece of God. Light comes from Christ. Jesus is waiting on his people to say yes to him when he calls us to his light, when he calls us to his unchangeable light. And when we all grab a hold of the salvation of Jesus Christ, the blood of the lamb, our testimony will be powerful and we will become his people. Leadership will be seen amongst his people. For David says these powerful words together. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It seems so simple. And yet mankind, the majority of mankind, is looking to an elected leader or looking to an individual over there in Rome to solve all the world's problem. Revelation 16, 11, and they blasphemed God of heaven because of their pain, their sores, and did not repent their deeds. Friends, again, a change of heart will not come unless it's happening now by the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's dangerous to turn away teachings of God's word when the Holy Spirit gives it to us. If we don't look at his light now, we won't find it when it's too late. The plagues are to get us ready. The knowledge of the plagues are to give us what we need to go through. Because if we don't know what's happening in the future, your hearts will fail you for fear. Because humanly, it's impossible to go through these difficult times. But in Christ, this will be the hour of your greatest characteristics that Christ can give you. Because you will, I promise you, every one of you here will come to the point where you can't make it alone. And whoever we choose that day will not be based upon who you are, but who we are in Christ and what he has done through us now. All right, the last um, pardon me, the number six is in extremely interesting. Why? Because even back in Ronald Reagan's time, they thought the Battle of Armageddon was coming in some major volatile movements in the Middle East. But friends, the Battle of Armageddon will not come until the previous five plagues have already taken place. 
It's amazing how people want to talk about the battle of Armageddon, but they don't want to talk about the other plagues because they don't have answers. They look over the Middle East and think it's a fulfillment of the battle of Armageddon. The sixth angel poured out, not the first angel, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now stop there for a moment. Whenever you're reading these plagues, you want to ask yourself, is this possible to take place just as it reads? If not, there's a deeper spiritual message here for us. Remember, Jesus had to put very um, challenging messages in parables because the Jews wouldn't have allowed his message to get out unless it was in a parable they couldn't understand. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. And its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be what? Now you'll hear prophecy lectures say, after the church is raptured out, this literal river Euphrates will be dried up and over one million soldiers from China is going to cross it. I have a niece that her husband is a very high-ranking officer in a group of the military called the Seabees. Anybody know what the Seabees are? Anybody? Okay. They are the ones that go in and set up the big cities when our troops are coming in by the thousands. They go in first, the Seabees do. And my niece's husband is a high-ranking officer in the Seabees. When anybody of the United States goes in in a large number, he has to go there in advance and set up the city. So not too many years ago, he, we had a religious conversation. And he knows what I teach on a regular basis for the last 20-some years. And he said, Lynn, he says, what's this about some of these prophecy lectures saying the literal river Euphrates has to dry up for these soldiers to cross? He said, do you believe it's a literal river Euphrates? I smiled. Remember, that's my response when people ask me conflicting questions. Always come back with a smile. It neutralizes the air. He, he wanted to really give me a tough time if I believed that it's a literal river Euphrates over there in the Middle East. I said, well, I think there's a deeper message there. He said, are you saying it's not the literal river? I said, well, you study it. Ask me whether it's literal. He said, well, I don't believe it's literal. I said, why? He said, you know how when we went into the Middle East here recently in Iraq and we blew up the bridges? He said, we can go right in after we've blown up the bridges and trap our enemy. We can come in and 45 minutes later, we have these huge hydraulic bridges that'll stretch out over the river and we drive tanks across them. Why would they be waiting on a literal river to dry up before one million soldiers walk across it? I said, you got a point there. So if it's not the literal river, you have to ask yourself, and by this time, when you get to Revelation 16, you will know what we have learned in the past, that waters represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Are you with me? Yes or no? All right, we've already discovered that in our time period, they're about to put up the laws that's going to force mankind across the United States to get into unity in worship, to bring our country Back to Christian principles. We found out the mark of the Catholic Church is forcing the Sunday movement, and they're already very clear about that. So when this Sunday law comes back in place, that the church is forcing the state to push the Sunday laws nationwide. Walmart won't have the freedoms they have now. And the plagues are falling. The state will do it because the churches will say, look, we need to bring unity back in our country. So the state will pass the laws. What happens? The first five plagues are falling. And finally, the state, the majority of people that are supporting these laws are going to say, you told us that if we would put these laws together and force our civilization, the United States and the world around, to worship on Sunday, that God would bless our nation. Look what's happening. The plagues are falling. Finally, the state says, we're not doing it anymore. We're not going out and doing your dirty work for you churches. The water dries up. The power behind the state armies dry up. Let's read on because it's very important. The river Euphrates, again, God gives us these examples in the Old Testament. You remember the old city Babylon? In chapter 5 fell to the Medes and Persians. We know how they fell. Cyrus diverted the literal river Euphrates 
to where it dried up enough that he marched his army right in that river bottom into the city and conquered the city that night. So the literal river Euphrates has already gone through those characteristics. So what is it spiritually about this river that will give us information tonight? Watch. There's something spiritual here. Cyrus diverted the, the river. Again, God's people were in ty ty tyranny of the ancient Babylon of the past. Jesus is the king of the east, amen? And he will deliver God's people at the end time. We're at about at the end of the plagues when this takes place. Behold, I come as a thief. Now notice, this is during the sixth plague. Jesus describes himself coming like a thief in the night. What? I thought he came like a thief in the night before the plagues came. I thought he raptured his people out before the plagues came. That's what people will tell me. But when you're honest with yourself and you take the Strong's Concordance and look up the word thief, you'll see he mentions himself coming like a thief here close to the sixth plague. Behold, he that watcheth and keepeth his what? Remember, garments represent the character that God has given us, the thoughts and feelings of God to this point, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What sense would it make to say that Christ delivers his people before the tribulation when the Bible says he comes like a thief after the tribulation? All right. Revelation 16, and he gathered them together in the place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. When you do your homework and you didn't throw the Old Testament away and say that you're a New Testament Christian, you'll discover where that word takes you. In the Hebrew, again, when they wrote the New Testament, all they had was the Old Testament. So the word Armageddon takes you back to the two words of the root. Arm, meaning har in the Hebrew, and Megiddo, okay, meaning har, meaning a mountain. All right, watch this carefully. A mountain called what? Megiddo, so a mountain of slaughter. That's what they thought it meant. Well, again, friends, har, arm, and Megiddo. Or it can mean mountain of, instead of Megiddo, the same Hebrew word means moed or this assembly. So watch, the mount of of the assembly. First of all, if you look, we've looked at all the Old Testament maps, all the ancient maps of the past. I've been over there in these different places called Megiddo, but you will never find a mountain called Megiddo. It's just not there. And yet if you look in the Hebrew and find the word Har Moed, which is the original of Armageddon, it takes you to the devil, which he declares in Isaiah 14, 13. He says, I will set upon the mount, the har, of the, where does he say he's going to put his mark? In the forehead, the mount, where God communicates with us spiritually. I will set in the mount of the congregation, the assemblies, in the sides of the north. Again, friends, it makes perfect sense. He says he's going to put his mark on people. What we need to understand is what we saw literally in the Old Testament, in the ancient Israel, we will see in a spiritual Israel in the last days. Ancient Israel was protected by Babylon, persecuted by Babylon, forced to worship an image called Babylon the Great. Babylon sets on many waters, rescued by dry, drying up the river Euphrates, called out of Babylon, called the anointed. All of these parallels to the Old Testament comes forward in Daniel and Revelation. Think about it. Why in our age when we have jets that are flying very fast, to say the least, and we have bombs that we can direct down a chimney. Why would we wait on a literal river Euphrates to dry up? It's the principle called what happened literally in the Old Testament on a local scale will happen in a spiritual sense worldwide in our time. Literal, local, spiritual, worldwide. In all theological seminaries, they teach this principle. Look for the parallels between Old Testament and New Testament. Find the spiritual parallels. That's why they call the New Testament believers spiritual Jews. Again, Isaiah says in 33, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. 
He that despises the gain of the oppression, shake his hands from holding a bribe, stop his ears from hearing of blood, shut his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. We will be in the caves of the rocks, and our water and bread will be sure. You see tonight, friends, the plagues are only scary to those who don't know Christ. And if you don't know him well enough to have confidence in him now, this is the day when you can change it. Spend time in his word. Only God can set his people free. Amen? Amos says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not of bread and water, not at all, but of hearing the words of the Lord. There's coming a time when people will not be able to spend the money that we have spent here to hold this seminar. That's why it's very, very, very important for you to gain what you are given absolutely free right now. Step forward in the faith that God has given you. Pick up the tools that you will receive as you step forward in faith. We shared with you the tools that we'll be giving out to everyone who makes or stand for Christ. Soon there's coming a day where people will not be able to spend twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars per seminar like was spent here to advertise this seminar. It's gonna be a famine. Of hearing the words of the Lord, people shall wander from sea to sea, from north even unto the west, and they shall run to and fro. For what reason? To seek for the word of the Lord. They know enough about Scripture that what it says. And when these things begin taking place, it's going to be too late. They shall not find it. The plagues are here today as the flashing warning lights of the coming events. And so that God's people will know that there will come a day when the wicked will be punished. For right now, we will love our enemies. We will pray for our enemies. When the plagues fall, you will know that your enemies have put it off too long. Jesus is coming soon, what do you say? He loves us and he's calling us to pick up the torch of truth and carry it to everyone. Seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying what friends? This is a solemn time. This is a time when God will have his people ready. It's a time that we can prepare for now. It's a time when we know all of the events that we've gone through by the grace of God, by the mercies of God. We've seen the vision of our place where we'll live throughout eternity and nothing can take the faith away from us. The Holy Spirit will have sealed his people. But friends, today our small decision prepares us for that time. Today is the day to choose. God has given you a mind to recognize truth and the difference thereof and where it comes from. There's coming a time when it will be finished and then you're going to hear the chariots coming. We're going to hear the angels singing praises. We're going to hear the trumpet sound. We're going to see the graves open up. Noises, thunderings, and lightnings, a great earthquake, such as mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. The greatest earthquake of all times. And no one will get time to tell how big it is. It's going to be worldwide. Every island fled away. The mountains no longer found. A great hail from heaven falls upon men. Every hailstone about the weight of a talent. And yet God's people have stronger faith than we've ever imagined. And we will look up in that hour and say, lo, this is our God. When the hail is falling, you can hear him falling through the air. The World War II veterans tell me they heard the bombs falling before they ever hit. When these 70-pound hail balls come through the sky, you'll hear them coming. But do you think your heart's going to be afraid? No. 
You've seen all the plagues. When the earth begins quaking, you know Jesus is coming. And your faith will be so strong that no hail ball can threaten you. That's the faith I want. Only God can give us that kind of faith. That day's coming, friends. And only God can give us courage now for that moment. We will have moments where your faith feels like it's about to fail. Be honest with yourself. When that comes, you're about to see a vision that we just read about tonight. The kingdom that is afar off. Tonight, my friends, all of the knowledge of the future is not given to us to scare us into following God. All the knowledge of the future is given to us so that our faith will be strengthened when the world is falling apart. It was a true story of when this country began. You probably know that there weren't banks that gave huge loans of a million dollars for your house. The way we built our houses in the original founding fathers, fathers of our country is you, would, you were given a plot of land. You would go in. The neighbors would find out you were settling there. And the neighbors would get together all on a weekend and raise up a barn, a house, whatever you needed. It was great. Fellowship time. Everybody knew everybody. True story, this young man heard about a neighbor that moved in, and early one morning he decided he was going over as all the neighbors had planned this event. And he went in and took care of his livestock in the barn, with the old lantern hanging up on the post there, and fed all of his animals, knew it'd be a while before he could get back. It was quite a number of miles over to his neighbor's. In the dark of the morning hours, he walked over the hills to get to his neighbors, where they all built up this big, beautiful house. And some other neighbors built up the barn. They just had a wonderful time. The ladies fixed the food. Really what community was meant to be. And on the way back after it was all done, a magnificent weekend, he was contemplating the good that humanity can do when we unite together with one cause. And as he crested that top hill, and as the sun's beginning to set, he went over that last hill and saw down in the valley where his house and barn was, and he got that sickening feeling. As soon as he saw the first trail of smoke, he knew what happened. He remembered he left a lantern hanging on the post of the barn right beside the horse, and, then the, and the horse knocked the lantern down, and the barn burnt to the ground with all of his livestock in it. While he was helping his neighbor, his was destroyed. Why? One of those moments. He's there in the ashes of the barn. Looking down at the piles of ashes, remembering what they were. Just trying to discover what, what good can come out of this. Not knowing what his next moment would bring. Even embarrassed to tell his neighbors what happened. And then God spoke to him. Because as he saw this pile of ashes right there in front of him, took his foot and moved it, thinking about his past, God spoke by revealing underneath this seeming pile of ashes was the remnants of a mother hen that had called her chicks under her wings. And amidst all of the destruction, he bent down, and what life was left made him smile. Because then he realized it wasn't what he sees, it's what he doesn't see. He remembered the text where David says, he shall cover you with his feathers. With me, under his wings you shall take refuge. His, his what? His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Now let me pause for a moment. Friends, when you are in the last moments of time, maybe it's not the last moments of time. Maybe it's right now. Only you know what you've been going through to come to this seminar night after night. The darts of other people's accusations. The accusations of others who have never set foot in here and yet they will spend every moment you will give them to condemn what's happening here. Remember this, 
His truth will be your shield. And your buckler. Now, most of us don't know what the buckler was, but going back into David's time, men wore very lavishing robes. And when you were in battle, you had to have a wide buckler or belt to pull your robe in tight. So when you are in battle and you're turning around facing the enemy that's coming upon you, if you don't have your robe, robe equals character. If you don't have your robe pulled in nice and tight, as you're turning to defend yourself over here, the enemy over here is going to grab your robe and you're dead. Get the picture. The truth is what keeps our robe, our character together in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? It's not what we think is truth. It's what's always been there. It's never changed. His truth shall be your shield. When others are throwing darts at you, just smile because you know they don't know what you know. And they're not coming to you to learn. They're coming to make you look bad. They are then working the task of the accuser of the brethren. We read about that this morning. The accuser of the brethren. You know when someone is in Christ because they will come and say, show me what you've learned. I want to see it in the Bible. If it's truth, I want to learn it. They're not afraid of losing their faith. They're not afraid of somebody that taught them, oh, stay away from this person, stay away from that person. We are all created by God. If your faith is strong enough in the word of God, you can be anywhere in Christ Jesus. His truth shall be your shield. His truth shall keep your character where it belongs. No evil shall befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Friends, it's time that God's people get ready. What do you say? The issue we need to discover tonight is clearly in those three angels' messages. The issue of the plagues are to help us to get ready when this happens soon. The last events of earth's history will be rapid ones. We won't have time to be training as an Olympiad when it's time to perform in Christ. The issue in the last days are clear. The creator God that created Adam out of the dust of the earth has died to pay the price that we can have this good news. He has paid the price that his people will be ready to meet him. I want to be that people. The issue in Adam and Eve's day was the first commandment. The issue in Daniel's day were the three Hebrew worthies was the second commandment. The issue in the last days will be the fourth commandment, as we've already discovered. But the principle never changes. Who will we be faithful to? and in love with, and loyal to. For those who are willing to stand, my friends, Jesus says, I'll take care of you. It's free. It's clear. And it has your name on it. Yes, heaven's a real place. And he wants us to be ready. He's going to give his angels charge over your life. Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And he wants to work that last miracle in your life where your feet leave the ground and you won't be afraid. That's going to be a miracle. Uh, can you say amen? <laughs> I don't know about you. I, I have a fear of heights when I get up so far. I see those skyscrapers and those men that erect that steel. When you leave the ground and your eyes are on Jesus, don't take your eyes off Jesus. Because there's nothing to look down for. It's all waste and destruction. I thank you for your interest in the truth. It will set you free from everything God says is coming. Let's stand as we pray tonight. Precious Father. We understand how our faith is growing in truth and righteousness. 
We understand that regardless of the truth that we are absorbing, we still need you 100% of the time. This truth is not to give us enough confidence that we can stand alone, for we will never stand alone. We are always dependent upon you and the Holy Spirit being with us all the time. We discover tonight that when we feel like our faith is going to fail, we just can't endure anymore. You give us that special vision, which gives us the charge to go through into the end. Thank you for the blessed hope. Thank you for the holiness of your word. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are in this room and watching on the web And maybe they're watching these DVDs right now in the quietness of their home. Father, we thank you for your presence in their life. We thank you for the victory that is always available to those who say yes. 